Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to this week, Health for the World Ground Run. Please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where are you logging in from in the chat box below. Right, so waiting for your response. You can put your cities, country that you are joining us today. All right, so I guess we can start the session. Um, it is my pleasure, it's my honor to introduce our guest for this week, Dr. Jit Patel. We, he will have a presentation about acute infections, emergency of the head and neck, followed by Q&A session. If you have any questions during the talk, please leave them in the chat box. We'll address them during Q&A session. Dr. G. Tattel is assistant professor at the University of Florida College of Medicine in Jacksonville. He trained in diagnostic radiology at the University of Michigan and subsequently he continued his fellowship training in neuroradiology at Brigham Hospital. The main area of his research is focused on emergency neuroradiology, head and neck anatomy and infections. Thank you for joining us for this week, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Sina. Um, all right, I'll start over. So this talk is entitled Acute Infectious Emergencies of the Head and Neck. And I just wanna thank everyone for uh, joining. I, I know um, everyone's in different time zones and I'm, it's 10 o'clock, so it's a very convenient time for me, but I, I really do appreciate you wherever you are uh, logging in. I hope uh, you, know, you, uh, you learned something beneficial from this. Um, so this talk is based off of um, cases that I have personally seen in the last few years. Um, they're all infectious emergencies they presented in the emergency department. Um, and they all have like key findings that uh, prompt, uh, uh, in my opinion, a change in management or specific findings that allow us to make a specific diagnosis that the, the imaging may have been attained for in the first reason. Um, the outline of the presentation, well, first I'm going to go through a checklist approach and everyone develops their own checklists, uh, but I'll kind of sh show you with some arrows and, and points of, of, of key locations to look at in different areas. And the different areas that we're going to cover are the oral cavity, the oropharynx, paranasal sinuses, orbits, and temporal bone. So it looks like a lot, but it's just going to be a few cases, key cases in some of these areas. And it's going to be after the, uh, I, I share my checklist approach, um, case based. So I'll take the cases, uh, I'll identify the key findings, and we'll just give some like pertinent information that you need to know from the clinical side. Um, and without ado, uh, if, you, if you have any questions, please, um, you know, uh, make a note of them. And at the, at the end, time permitting, I'll try to answer everyone's questions. All right, so there are key imaging findings and diagnoses that can be made off of those findings that can prompt uh, an emergency physician to, number one, um, decide to admit a patient for inpatient management. That's one of the, the key things in their disposition that they always have to decide. And number two, uh, urgently or emergently consult a surgical spub specialist um, if the patient requires uh, immediate uh, treatment in that regard. The absence of these findings are also pertinent negatives that enable clinicians in the emergency department to simply treat the patient in the emergency department or feel confident and feel that it's safe to discharge the patient with outpatient follow-up. Things to think about in your checklist as you as you make them and, and as they evolve um, in your practice. So I think we're always helpful in ra as radiologists if we can um, provide information about the cause or source of the infection. You know, you have to identify the findings and convey the important findings, but if you then can then put in the context of, you know, where this is coming from, that is helpful. Uh, you should always look into where the infection is spreading to. Um, so if it's very localized, you might not even see it on CT, but it might be the fact that they're concerned that there's a deep space infection or complex multispatial infection that prompted the imaging. So for adequate management, especially surgical management, it's important to clearly identify where, for example, an abscess is spreading to. Um, 
you know, you should always keep in mind, have I excluded all the things that might upgrade the management of the disinfection? I just touched upon that. Is there an abscess, a drainable abscess? If there is an abscess, is it going into certain spaces that really ring a bell and increase the um, alarm of the management necessary for this? So, for example, if it's an orbital infection, if it's just preceptal and superficial, you know, it's fine. They could probably just be treated with oral antibiotics. But if you show that or you demonstrate that it is spreading behind the ocular globe and it's post-septal, well, then that potentially buys a patient intravenous uh, antibiotics, possibly an inpatient admission. You know, obviously also look for incidental findings, but look for complications or association associated findings in the bones vessels if there's contrast and the intracranial compartment. All right, so first we'll start with dental or odontogenic infections. You should always look in this situation, are there dental caries? Is there periapical lucency as a um, sign of periodontal disease? Now, these things can be chronically present. They are not a sign necessarily that there's an acute infection. However, they can be the um, they can be the setting from which an acute uh, uh, dental infection arises. So this can often clue you into which tooth might be the culprit. Um, is there bone erosion? So you want to look at the alveolar cort cortices of the maxilla and mandible. And if there's a breach or erosion through the uh, this cortex, now this is normal cortex, but if you see a hole in here, dehiscence next to where there's periapical lucency, that might be a cause for abscess forming adjacent to that site. Is there an adjacent abscess? So I've got these little uh, ovals that I'm, I've drawn in key locations where you need to look to see if there's an abscess. And when they're small, it can be kind of tricky. It can be hard to see, but looking at especially coronal reformatted soft tissue windows, you can see the interface between the normal soft tissues and the bone very nicely. And you might pick up on if, if you've if contrast has been administered a rim enhancing fluid collection at that site. It's important to keep in mind that for many dental infections, CT is not needed. It's really indicated only if there's concern for a deep space infection. So, for example, if there's swelling underneath the tongue or where the patient has any signs of airway compromise, if there's swelling in the neck, they might be concerned that it's spreading deep into that area, or if it's going along the face up to the orbit and the superficial tissues of the orbit are, are swollen, well then CT might be indicated to screen and exclude any post-septal uh, complicated orbital infection that may have been a, uh, arise secondary from the uh, initial dental infection. So you wanna look at the sublingual space in the floor of the mouth, the floor of the mouth is actually contained by a muscle that, that's like a hammock called a mylohyoid muscle that separates the oral cavity from the true submental and submandibular space. And you can see that this orange line shows how that mylohyoid muscle runs in the coronal plane. There's uh, musculature of the tongue, the genoglossus and genohyoid muscle situated in between. And that separates the floor of the mouth into two separate sublingual spaces. So I've got a, a yellow line here and here showing what the sublingual space looks like. Here's that orange line of where that mylohyoid posterior margin runs. Now the sublingual space is actually contiguous with the submandibular space. That's why I've got this arrow here. So the mylohyoid separates the sublingual and submandibular spaces in the coronal plane, but it doesn't run all the way back at the posterior aspect, it has a free edge. And over that free edge, the infection in the sublingual space could spread into the submandibular space. So you have to keep a note of that. If there's an abscess, you need to tell them if that abscess is extending into the submandibular space as well. The masticator space, uh, there's the masticator space musculature here. There's a red oval in the masseter muscle, lateral and overlying the ramus of the mandible. And on the medial side, there's a medial pterygoid muscle deep to the ramus of the mandible. Molar infections, especially third molar infections, could potentially extend into the masticator space. So that is a 
site that needs to be checked. And also patients who have masticator space infections in particular might present with trismus and difficulty opening their jaw because of the infection affecting the musculature. There's premaxillary and facial tissues that need to be inspected. So uh, right in front of and superior to the lip, there's something called the canine space. That's more of an oral surgeon term, but the canine space is a space that runs deep to the facial musculature and uh, superficial to the maxilla and actually extends all the way up to the orbit. That's the root of spread of anterior dental, especially anterior maxillary dental infections to the orbit. And finally, make sure you look at the bones in bone window. Are there any signs of osteomyelitis? That's obviously a complication that would require uh, long-term antibiotics as treatment as well. Oral pharyngeal infections, these are much simpler. Really, you're looking at the palatine tonsil. In most cases, if someone has a complication of an acute tonsillitis, a palatine tonsillitis, they may develop a abscess in their tonsil, which we refer to as a peritonsillar abscess. I believe that's because the capsule of the tonsil, the abscess is outside of the actual capsule of the tonsil. So anatomically, it's a peritonsillar abscess, even though it looks like it's amidst the actual palatine tonsil. Anyway, is there a rim enhancing fluid collection that's suggestive of an abscess? But beyond that, is that abscess extending into other spaces in particular, is it expanding into this fat, which is the peripharyngeal space, or is it extending posteriorly into the retropharyngeal space? And I'm not quite just talking about cellulitis. Oftentimes with people with tonsillitis, you'll see edema, reactive changes, and just um, dirty fat uh, attenuation in that area. And you might even see an effusion, but I'm kind of more referring to, is there frank extension of that fluid collection, that discrete rim enhancing fluid collection into these spaces because that can change the uh, surgical management for drainage. Also, if you've given contrast, you got to look at the vessels. So here's the internal jugular vein. You need to see has there been any sort of um, septic thrombosis of a vein. We think of the eponymous disease, Lemire's disease, where there's tonsillitis, thrombus in the um, internal jugular vein, and then a complication of um, emboli arising from that thrombus. Sinus infections, this, similar to as in the teeth, can have some nonspecific findings that may be present in any patient that's being scanned for other reasons and seen incidentally. For example, mucosal thickening. Many patients scan for any sort of head CT, any reason for a head CT, you'll see incidentally mucosal thickening that is of essentially no clinical significance. Air fluid levels. We see air fluid levels all the time too. Maybe the patient's had a recent cold or has a cold and that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for an aggressive invasive infection, but an air fluid level could clue you into the fact that some sort of inflammatory process is present. So it's not necessarily indicative of an acute severe infection, but it is a nonspecific finding that could be associated with that. So what are signs of an aggressive infection in the sinuses? All right, so the things that I look for are, number one, is there any sign of adjacent inflammation in the fat? So you had to look at all the bone walls of the maxillary sinuses and the frontal sinuses and make sure that there's clean fat adjacent to them. So in the retromaxillary space, there should be clean fat. In the premaxillary space, there should be clean fat. If you see inflammatory changes there and they have a concern for an invasive fungal sinusitis, as well, that raises the concern that there is such an infection present on imaging. Bone erosion, are there any signs of subtle bone erosion? That might not be present though. These infections are so aggressive and, and move so fast, if you will. Uh, they can basically extend through using you know, uh, veins into the next space and you might not even see bone erosion at the time of uh, initial imaging. The sinuses are adjacent to the orbits. So you have to look for subperiosteal orbital abscesses which occur within the potential space of the periosteum as an extension of the sinus infection into the true orbital space. And if contrast has been given, you have to look for things that don't enhance and should be enhancing, not just things that are enhancing like an abscess. So what would be bad 
if it's not enhancing, well, on a post-contrast study, if a vein is not enhancing, then that means that the vein is likely thrombosed. So if you don't see physiologic enhancement in the cavernous sinuses in someone who's got a severe invasive fungal um, sinus infection, well, then that's uh, a diagnosis of cavernous sinus thrombosis. Temporal bone. All right. So the nonspecific, let's get that out of the way first. Unfortunately, just like in the sinuses, we often see some degree of impassification, might even be trace in the mastoid air cells, just a little bit of fusion. You know, the mastoid air cells communicate with the middle ear cavity, which communicates through the eustachian tube with the nasopharynx. So people get backed up flow there, especially kids. You know, maybe they had a middle ear infection recently. You know, adults too, commonly you'll see um, some trace uh, effusion. However, that's not what the sign is or the, uh, the, the specific sign is for an aggressive infection. What we're looking for is along with the pacification, there must be a pacification, along with the pacification, is there destructive erosive change in those mastoid air cells? So here are nice bony septi producing the air cells in the mastoid. If these start getting destroyed and we say co become coalescent, that is a sign of a complicated mastoid infection, so coalescent mastoiditis. In addition, you have to look at all the cortex of the temporal bone as well, especially the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, the outer cortex and the inner cortex, because breaches, dehiscence, erosion of those cortices is a means of spread then into the adjacent tissues. You could get subcutaneous um, abscesses. Um, you know, there's Beasold's abscess that can occur from spread inferiorly through an erosion through the cortex. And then you can get infectious thrombosis of the sigmoid sinus if it extends medially through the inner cortex. And you can get intracranial abscesses or sub, sub, uh, subdural empyemas if there's an intracranial infection. Obviously, you need contrast uh, to be able to diagnose whether there's a thrombus inside the vein. Lastly, there's one space that I like to uh, point out. It's the retrocondylar uh, uh, space. Usually you should see clean fat here, but if you see a lot of uh, edema in here, thickening, soft tissue thickening in the setting of an external otitis infection, that has been seen as a deep space um, extension of otitis externa that is seen in the setting of malignant otitis externa. All right, so we'll go to our cases now. I'm going to take the case. No one has to take the cases. Uh, I'm not going to give the diagnosis right away, um, but then I'll, I'll, I'll show you some points and I'll, I'll just uh, reinforce some of those imaging findings as well. So this is a 25-year-old female with left facial swelling three images, there's contrast enhanced axial CT image, coronal image, and a bone reconstruction window um, axial. So on the axial soft tissue image, we see swelling of the left masseter muscle relative to the normal right side. And this is a contrast enhanced CT. We see a rim enhancing fluid collection that is consistent with an abscess that is overlying and adjacent to the lateral aspect of the ramus of the left ramus of the mandible. This is what that abscess looks like on coronal imaging. So it's a relatively large abscess, probably needs to be drained. The bone window is essential here for determining what the cause of this infection is. So here you see a impacted third mandibular molar. It's situated kind of in the mesial direction. That's an abnormal impaction. And so this patient's probably at risk for um, deterioration of this uh, tooth just because it's not going to be cleaned properly. And here's a severe dental caries right here in the crown, and there's periapical lucency as well. And then the final finding that, or the second find, the last finding that's important here is that there's erosion through the outer cortex, and that's how that rim-enhancing fluid collection, the abscess, formed. There's one more finding, and it's very subtle. There's periosteal reaction along the uh, lateral aspect of the ramus of the mandible, suggesting that there might be osteomyelitis present here as well.
So this is an odontogenic masticator space abscess. This patient requires intravenous antibiotics and should have an oral and maxillofacial surgery consultation for drainage and definitive treatment. The superficial masticator space is extensive. So the, the most super superior lying ma masticator space muscle is the temporalis muscle and it reaches all the way up to your head um, along the, the uh, near to almost the vertex. So conceivably a, an abscess or infection that extends into that muscle could potentially spread all along the side of your head. Um, so it's something that can get out of control fast if it's not properly treated. Um, extra oral surgical drainage is likely to be performed in a patient like this. So again, the extent of the abscess should be communicated in your report. Finally, the primary dental infection has to be um, managed for definitive treatment of the cause of this um, process. Next case, here's a 49-year-old male with left throat and neck pain. We have a coronal soft tissue window image, a coronal bone window image, and two key axial soft tissue images. The coronal image shows that there is mass effect and edema in the left side of the floor of the mouth. See how the left side of the tongue is actually being elevated up. And so there's narrowing of the oral cavity airway because of what's going on in the left side of the floor of the mouth. So what space are we in exactly? We're in their sublingual space. There's a fluid and gas collection. Here's the, mar here's the line, the mylohyoid muscle coming down from the mylohyoid line where it attaches and coming down and attaching to the anterior aspect of the hyoid muscle here. So there's an abscess containing gas in the left sublingual space. What's the cause of this? Well, you can see in a molar tooth here, there's periapical lucency and then there's erosion of the lingual aspect of the alveolar cortex. And that's what caused this dental infection. On these axial images, these are important because they're showing where this abscess is going to. So these are actually, this is at the level of the floor of the mouth, and this is just below the level of the floor of the mouth. This structure here is the submandibular gland, and you can see that the fluid and the gas within that collection is reaching down all the way to the level of the submandibular gland and it is adjacent to it. So this sublingual infection is actually moving post has moved posteriorly past that free margin of the myelohyoid muscle and has extended inferiorly into the submandibular space. So there's a sublingual and submandibular space abscess, which was odontogenic. This patient requires obviously intravenous antibiotics and an urgent oral surgery consultation. Sublingual and submandibular infections can cause mass effect on the airway and respiratory distress. And you should think about, although it's not an imaging diagnosis, Ludwig's angina, which has been described in people with uh, fast deteriorating, clinically deteriorating, toxic appearance uh, associated with airway compromise, generally secondary to mass infect from a sublingual uh, floor of the mouth slash submandibular infection. The sublingual space, as I said, communicates posteriorly with the submandibular space, and the location should be accurately described and communicated. If it was just confined to the sublingual space, then an intraoral approach for surgical drainage would be preferred. However, if the submandibular approach is uh, a submandibular space is also involved, then an external submandibular approach would also be utilized to get to the abscess. Again, the primary dental infection must be identified for definitive treatment of what caused this process. Here's a 22-year-old male with marked asymmetric tonsillar swelling. So we're moving out of the anatomic oral cavity now into the oral pharyngeal space. This 22-year-old man has a multiloculated rim-enhancing fluid collection centered in the left palatine tonsillar fossa. So this is a peritonsillar abscess. You can see that it has an irregular shape. There's diffuse thickening of the oropharyngeal 
tissues and lingual tonsil, the, the bilateral uh, lateral uh, aspect, palatine tonsils, as well as the lingual tonsil next to the base of the tongue, which may have been from pre-existing tonsillar hypertrophy or could represent the tonsillitis. But indeed, on top of that, there is a frank abscess here that's relatively large. It's actually pushing the airway um, towards the right and causing narrowing of the oral pharyngeal airway as well. And here's a key finding, though, that must be communicated. Posteriorly, that abscess is not confined to the oropharyngeal space. It is extending into the retropharyngeal space. Here's prevertebral musculature on the left side and on the right. There's a almost kind of like a potential retropharyngeal space, and this is actually extending into that retropharyngeal space. On the sagittal image, you get a better appreciation of that too. Here's the oropharyngeal component of the peritonsillar abscess, and then here's the protrusion of that collection into the retropharyngeal space. So this is a peritonsillar abscess extending into the retropharyngeal space. Peritonsillar abscesses confined to the tonsillar fossa might be treated with just antibiotics if they're small, plus or minus transoral percutaneous drainage, which might be done by the emergency physician on their own. Uh, this patient likely, however, requires an inpatient admission, intravenous antibiotics, and an urgent otolaryngology consultation. Even if they're not going to drain this portion, it's good for this patient to be seen by a surgeon to have uh, get, get their eyes on them and uh, be involved in the management in case it's necessary. Depending on whether there's acute distress and airway compromise, the surgical drainage may be performed emergently or after observing the response to initial medical management. 45-year-old male with clinically suspected peritonsillar abscess. So this patient, similar to the last patient, has a left peritonsillar abscess. It's irregular shaped, but we also want to communicate if it's going into any of the other spaces we talked about in our checklist. So this one isn't going into the retropharyngeal space, I think there's probably a little bit of a small retropharyngeal effusion without rim enhancement that might be reactive, but this one is going into the parapharyngeal space. So you can see clean fat in the right parapharyngeal space, and on these two images, you can see the extension of the fluid within the um, abscess into that parapharyngeal space. So it's not just edema, the actual frank abscess is extending into the Peripharyngeal space. This patient would obviously also benefit then from an oral and maxillofacial surgery consultation or otolaryngology de consultation, depending on which service manages this uh, issue um, at your respective institution. Um, surgical drainage of the abscess extending into the peripharyngeal space could require an external approach to access the peripharyngeal space if it is deemed necessary. Moving on to the sinuses, here's a 21-year-old female with fever and worsening facial pain. Now, these are not, this is a non-contrast study. This patient had um, an immunocompromised state. And what are the findings here? Uh, there's an air fluid level and there's mucosal thickening in the right maxillary sinus. Remember how I said that's nonspecific? I usually say if there's no if there's no concern for an acute invasive fungal infection, say it's incidentally seen, I just put it in my impression saying there's an air fluid level, recommend clinical correlation for recent sinusitis or an upper respiratory tract infection that may account for these findings because they may have just had a cold or may have a cold, um, a simple uh, ordinary run in the mill cold, and that might be why that finding is present. But this person has fever, worsening facial pain, and they have a clinical um, history that makes them at risk for um, a severe sinus infection. So what's the key finding here? Well, there's inflammation in the pre-maxillary tissues. That's what was linked to the facial pain. So with that swelling and also with some edema here in the retropharynge, uh, retromaxillary space, that then becomes concerning for an acute uh, fungal invasive infection, sinusitis. Now, this patient actually started developing erosive changes in their posterior wall of their right maxillary sinus. But even without that finding, if I had this history and I saw this thickening where it should not be, I would still make the same diagnosis. So it's nice to see that, but 
um, even without it, there's enough here to make the call. So this is a medical emergency with a generally poor prognosis, emergent uh, otolaryngology consultation for debridement of infected necrotic tissue is required. And this patient is likely going to need broad spectrum antifungal uh, therapy and antibiotics. Complications uh, can occur from this that you need to look for, especially if you have contrast on board that helps you identify these findings. And that includes intracranial extension of the infection with abscess formation. Um, orbital extension, cavernous sinus thrombosis, and arteritis. Um, so it's a good idea, if possible, to give intravenous contrast on CT to these patients. So that's what I'm going to show you next. Uh, here's a 42-year-old male with facial cellulitis. And this is one of the worst uh, complications of a what started as a peripheral infection that I've ever seen. So this man has diffuse thickening of their facial subcutaneous tissues along their face, which is in keeping with the clinically diagnosed facial cellulitis. They've also got an air fluid level in their left maxillary sinus, and they've got a pacification partially in their left ethmoid air cells. So they had a sinusitis as well. The contrast enhanced CT images show in another key finding though. So notice that here on the, trans, on the transverse sinus, you see physiologic post-contrast enhancement of the vein. You can even see venous enhancement here along a portion of the tentorium that we're uh, visualizing on the study. But there's something that's not enhancing that you need to see. So if you look at the cavernous sinuses, with contrast this bright in other venous sinuses, this whole area ought to be as bright as this, but it's not. It's completely absent. What you do see enhancing are actually the intracranial internal carotid arteries. So this patient has bilateral cavernous sinus thrombosis. How does that happen? Well, the orbital and facial veins tend to be valveless. So they don't just drain blood from the intracranial compartment out, but unfortunately, blood can go backwards into the intracranial compartment as well and carry um, infectious pathogens with it. So there's thrombosis in the cavernous sinus. This patient got an MRI. Here you see the pituitary gland uh, enhancing on this coronal reformatted post-contrast image. There's thrombus in the bilateral cavernous sinuses. The thickening from the acute thrombus is actually even causing mass effect on the pituitary gland and pushing the pituitary gland slightly to the left. On the post-contrast axial images, again, you see the non-enhancement from the cavernous sinus thrombosis. But there's another finding here that's important. Remember how I talked about you see the enhancement of the intracranial internal carotid arteries? Well, on MRI, you don't really see that, but you see the walls concentrically enhancing and thickened. So this patient has an arteritis on top of all the other findings. And because of that arteritis, they then developed embolic acute infarcts seen on this axial DWI image. This patient unfortunately passed away several days later. So facial cellulitis and sinusitis with cavernous sinus thrombosis. I think the offending pathogen was mucormycosis in this, uh, in this patient. The septic cavernous sinus thrombosis has very poor prognosis and is generally treated medically with broad spectrum IV antibiotics and antifungal therapy and also antithrombotic therapy. Surgical intervention may be considered depending on the source of the infection or other complications. So if there's Orbital mass effect, decompression of the orbit might be required, or if there's an intracranial abscess, a craniotomy for evacuation of that abscess might be necessary. And other vascular complications that can occur, as in this patient, are arteritis, spasm with embolotic stroke, mycotic aneurysms, and hemorrhagic infarction. Here's a younger patient, a child, 16-year-old female with forehead swelling and fever. If you didn't have the images here, just with that history, you could potentially make the diagnosis uh, because there's an eponymous disease named after this presentation, uh, which is which is shown here. Uh, so we have the CT, we have the axial bone window and sagittal bone window. I just think this shows the overall process really well. That's why I've got sagittal images on this case. And then an MRI that was done after the CT. Um, post-contrast axial and reformatted sagittal images. So here we see on the CT, you don't even need the soft tissue window, you see thickening diffusely of the 
subcutaneous tissues along the forehead. There's air fluid levels and opacity in the frontal sinuses. There's also opacification in the anterior ethmoid air cells. So there's a sinusitis here. We don't know if that's something that's necessarily acute all the time, but in someone who then has forehead swelling and a fever, then you have to make the comment that, you know, this is actually an infectious acute sinusitis, not just something that was incidentally seen. The post-contrast MRI images show diffuse enhancement from the cellulitis in the forehead subcutaneous tissues, and then they show this pocket of fluid that's non-enhancing overlying the bone of the forehead, and that's a subperiosteal abscess. So intracranially, there's also another peripherally enhancing small pocket of fluid. These aren't even really drainable, but there's a finding here, and that's a epidural abscess. So here's the epidural abscess on the sagittal image. Here's the subperiosteal uh, superficial forehead abscess, all occurring secondary to this acute fungal sinusitis. So this is frontal sinusitis with pot puffy tumor. That's the eponym. The pot puffy tumor is a subcutaneous abscess and forehead swelling secondary to frontal sinusitis. This patient requires inpatient admission, IV antibiotics, and a neurosurgical consultation. Neurosurgery in this case didn't do anything. You know, it's such a small abscess that it's uh, not indicated for it to be drained. However, when you have any sort of infection extending into the intracranial con compartment or at risk for, you should definitely get them on board uh, for their advice and consultation. The contrast enhanced imaging is necessary to detect small subcutaneous abscesses and intracranial abscesses and careful attenu uh, attention is therefore necessary to detect uh, these findings. Keep in mind that MRI is going to be more sensitive to, than CT, especially for the detection of small abscesses. Moving on to the orbits, this is a 25-year-old female with rapidly worsening preceptal swelling. Now, you and even the emergency physician or whoever's sending you this consultation can tell you that there's an orbital infection here. What they're going to see is prominent swelling of the left eye. The eyelids might even be swollen shut. So they know that there's an infection. The key is, is that infection extending posterior to the ocular globe? Is it in the preceptal space? So you have the, the postseptal space, sorry. So the preceptal space is defined by the orbital septa, which runs along basically like the eyelid. And you can think of all the periorbital soft tissues and tissues anterior to that as the preceptal region. And then posterior to that is the postseptal region. So you need to tell them, is there a postseptal infection? Because they will not be able to determine that um, just based on the swelling that they see um, on clinical exam. So this patient has postseptal infection. They've got the preceptal infection with the edema and swelling that is already known, but then posterior to the ocular globe and adjacent, there's also edema within the retrobulbar fat. And that's the uh, sign that the infection has spread, unfortunately, into the postseptal compartment. Not just that, but this patient actually has signs of orbital compartment syndrome. Look at the contour of this left ocular globe. This should have a nice round shape. But here, if you can see, there's a little bit of distortion of that posterior margin of the left ocular globe. So there's actually tenting and traction occurring on the posterior margin by the left optic um, nerve that's slightly pulling on it because of the increased pressure that's pushing the ocular globe out with the proptosis. So this is actually a surgical emergency. Given the orbital and postoptical cellulitis, this patient required inpatient admission in uh, both broad spectrum IV antibiotics. The proptosis tenting of the globe and stretching of the optic nerve are consistent with orbital compartment syndrome, which required urgent ophthalmy ophthalmological consultation for decompressive surgery, and the patient had an urgent lateral canthotomy to relieve the orbital pressure. So here's what they look like before, and then after the lateral canthotomy, they actually left a drain because they were getting some fluid out, and that's how this patient was managed uh, urgently. Here's another young patient. We're moving on uh, to another portion of the orbits, but it kind of incorporates the sinuses as well. 
nine-year-old male with fever and eye swelling. So right off the bat, you can see that there's proptosis here. Look how anterior this right ocular globe is relative to the left. This is pretty pronounced. Um, but they might not be able to tell that. You never know. They might just see swelling, and and you know, it's it's it could be a guess as to whether there's actually proptosis present as well. So this patient on these axial and coronal images is seen to have complete opacification of the right ethmoid air cells, and then there's also a rim enhancing fluid collection broadly along those ethmoid air cells adjacent to the lamina papyracea. So there's an abscess present here, and it's a subperiosteal abscess. It's within a potential space dividing the orbital bone from the ethmoid air cells, and that's where the abscess extended into from the ethmoid air cells. So there is an orbital abscess, but it's a subperiosteal abscess. So this patient requires inpatient admission and IV antibiotics and a surgical consultation. Most often, uh, these are most often secondary to infection spread from the ethmoid air cells, so that would uh, involve the medial orbit, but you can also get infections from the frontal sinus if they wrap along the roof of the orbit and have an extension into the superior orbit from a frontal sinus infection. Um, the larger the size and if there's orbital mass effect, then there's usually uh, surgical drainage required. Uh, sinus surgery is often also required because you need the sinus drainage pathways to be opened up to prevent a recurrence. So this is really an issue in the sinuses that spilled over into the orbit. So definitive management is obviously going to require some sort of treatment for uh, obstruction that may have caused this uh, ethmoid air cell infection. Here's a 48-year-old female with left eye swelling. So this patient does have a pacification in their left ethmoid air cells and has some secretions in their nasal cavity, but this isn't a subperiosteal reaction here. So we see preceptal uh, infection that they were able to see clinically, and then there's a rim-enhancing fluid collection in the anterior medial portion of the left orbit. But notice how this abscess, which is what this is, this abscess doesn't extend broadly along those ethmoid air cells as the last case did. This is actually kind of confined to the anterior medial aspect. It's problematic. It's actually causing mass effect and compressing the left ocular globe. So this is a surgical case too. Um, but the other thing it's in relation to is the start of the nasal lacrimal duct. That's, that's a very superior part of the nasal lacrimal duct here. And this is kind of almost like protruding into that duct. So this was acute decryocystitis related abscess with a preceptal cellulitis and it was infection of the lacrimal sac which is part of the tear drainage pathway. Decryocystitis is inflammation of that lacrimal sac and can be complicated by abscess and this patient requires an ophthalmological surgical consultation for abscess drainage and then also follow-up decryocystorhinostotomy I'm sorry, there's a lot of syllables in that word. After the infection resolves to open up that lacrimal, uh, nasal lacrimal duct pathway, because this often occurs because of obstruction of the nasal lacrimal duct, which drains into the inferior meatus of the nasal cavity. Okay, moving on to our last space, the temporal bone. It's a 30, 55 year old male with ear pain and perforated tympanic membrane. The abnormality is on the left side. So notice the right side, this is the normal side. You got nice air and air, mastoid air cells on the right side, but on the contralateral left side, not only is there some thickening in the peripheral soft tissues, but there's complete opacification of the visualized mastoid air cells, and you're starting to lose those little bony septi, so there's coalescent erosive change occurring in the left mastoid. So this is coalescent mastoiditis. This patient requires IV antibiotics and an urgent otolaryngology consultation. Bone erosion, so coalescence of the mastoid air cells, I'll say it again, indicates an aggressive infection. You have to be careful because you could just have a simple mastoiditis, and if you don't really 
communicate the nuance of what is present, they may infer that you mean that an aggressive infection is is present. So if you're going to use the word mastoiditis, just make sure you clarify whether there's any signs of aggressive change present or not, because you can often have just a simple otomastoiditis is related to a middle ear infection, which is just backup of the fluid into the mastoid, and it's not truly necessarily any kind of aggressive infection, which requires that degree of uh, attention and urgency to it. So be careful about how you relay findings and how you describe things. Um, contrast enhanced CT should be performed in a patient like this to rule out additional complications such as an abscess externally in the subcutaneous tissues or extension intracranially and also to exclude if there's any infectious uh, venous sinus thrombosis in the sigmoid sinus. Here's a seven-year-old male with fever, ear pain, and mastoid tenderness. I've got two axial bone images, two axial soft tissue contrast enhanced CT images, and a coronal soft tissue uh, image that's windowed to look at the vessels. So on this patient, this person definitely has a coalescent mastoiditis. You can see that there's complete opacification of the mastoid air cells, even of the middle ear cavity, and there's erosive changes that have occurred with loss of those um, bony septi that uh, define the mastoid air cells. But there's a lot more going on here. There's almost complete erosion of the inner cortex along the sigmoid plate that's adjacent to where the sigmoid sinus runs. Keep that in the back of your mind. We're gonna come back to that with the soft tissue images. Inferiorly at the mastoid tip, there are also areas of erosion. And when you switch to the soft tissue windows, you see next to that inferior mastoid tip, there's abscess with rim enhancing multiloculated fluid collection that's extending inferiorly quite deep along the right uh, paraspinous cervical musculature. We're all right down to the C1 vertebral level here, and that abscess is extending even further inferior to that. On that coronal soft tissue window adjacent to where there was erosion of the sigmoid plate, there's non-enhancement of where there should be enhancement. Here's a contralateral sigmoid sinus adjacent to the bone, you can make it out right here. We want to see something like this density, but we see nothing. So there's a thrombosis of the right sigmoid sinus secondary to the mastoid infection. So this is mastoid, mastoiditis complicated by Beasold abscess and drovenous sinus thrombosis. Beasold abscess is extension of an abscess from the mastoid deep to the sternocleidomastoid musculature and other deep uh, cervical tissues. In addition to IV antibiotics, this patient requires urgical, urgent surgical consultation for cervical approach, incision and drainage, and then also a mastoidectomy to drain the mastoid. Treatment of the sigmoid sinus thrombosis is controversial. The considerations include surgical thrombectomy during the mastoidectomy and or anticoagulation. Here's my final case. This is an 84-year-old diabetic male with left facial paralysis. If someone told you there's a diabetic male with a temporal bone infection, didn't show you any images, you already know what you should be looking for. I'm going to give you that name soon. Here's two, uh, there, here's, uh, two bone images of the temporal bone, axial and coronal, and then a soft tissue window um, of the temporal bone level. There's complete opacification of the mastoid air cells. There's erosion and coalescent change in the mastoid. So this person has a complicated coalescent mastoiditis. Definitely have that. There's erosive changes of the inferior mastoid uh, outer cortex. And there's also erosion of the external auditory canal bone. So. On the right side here, you see normal air extending into the external artery canal. You can see the tympanic plate of the external artery canal. We're at the same level here, and it's gone, mostly gone. Most of that in tympanic membrane, tympanic plate adjacent to the temporomandibular joint is completely eroded. There's severe soft tissue thickening along the external auditory canal. And then there's also thickening of the retrocondylar tissues within the or space within the left temporomandibular joint. So this patient had malignant otitis externa. Um, this patient requires IV antibiotics, strict glucose control, 
That's what the setup is. It's usually Pseudomonas, which is the uh, uh, infectious pathogen, and they need an otolaryngology consultation. So contrast and hint CT should be performed to identify any abscesses, although non-contrast CT can demonstrate the erosions that are indicative of the osteomyelitis related to this process. So you can make the diagnosis just off of, of non-contrast CT. It's just that the the CT is going to be helpful for checking for any drainable fluid collections, abscesses intracranially or in the deep tissues that might need to be addressed. MRI can be helpful because it's more sensitive for uh, demonstrating intracranial complications such as epidural abscesses, and it's better at showing the extent of any skull-based osteomyelitis that might be present. Finally, debridement of necrotic tissue and drainage of the deep abscesses is required. That's all I've got. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Thank you for the comprehensive and insightful lecture on acute infections, emergency of the head and neck, and all the interesting cases. So I think we can maybe move to the Q&A session. But before that, I just want to mention that today we have a special panelist here, Dr. William Dillon, our co-founder of the Health for the Board, executive vice chair of the radiology at the UCSF, professor of neuroradiology at UCSF as well, and the past president of the American Society of Neuroradiology and American Society of Head and Neck Radiology. We are very glad to have you here this week, Dr. Dillon, as well. So I think maybe we can start the uh, questions. Um, so if you have any question, you can type it here. Well, I just want to say uh, to uh, Dr. Patel, what a what a fantastic overview of the issues of head and neck um, infections, and uh, I think your your point about uh, dental infections is such a, an important one because as uh, as radiologists, as neuroradiologists, we we tend to overlook that uh, area, which is a um, in my practice, frequently uh, seen actually, and and uh, uh, I was just on call this last weekend, and there were a number of cases that that were uh, it, that had infections of the head and neck that were dental in origin, and in addition, some of the uh, patients who go on to uh, have uh, transplants are being imaged now for um, periodontic disease beforehand just to make sure that they don't have a source for infection. So it's a very important area, I think, for us to pay attention to. So thank you again for a great lecture. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Patel, I have a uh, I, I have one question, if you don't mind, I can uh, go over it. So in terms of the case that uh, there was a 16 years old female who presented with the uh, swelling cases that turned out to be compartment syndrome. So as part of treatment, it was mentioned that uh, eventually patient need, would need drainage and the antibiotics. Uh, but meantime, I was thinking that uh, since like compart uh, compartment syndrome can damage the uh, optic disc, is there any uh, way that we can consider the glaucoma medication to lower the pressure in meantime? Because I'm thinking that uh, the drainage might take a uh, while and uh, like that we can lower the pressure um, inside the, uh, I mean like lower the intraocular pressure. You know, that's a good question. Um, I have to be honest, I, I don't know the answer. Um... I think it could be a situation where, you know, if you don't have access, I think I, I, at, at our hospital, they don't do that. Um, but that's also because we have uh, treatment teams readily available for that purpose. I think if you're in a place where you don't, where there could be a delay, um, that's definitely something to talk to uh, someone who's specifically in that um uh, area and knows the management um, to speak to them about that because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just not up to date with the glaucoma. Um, uh, I didn't even know that that's a possibility. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I have one more question. So the other one is about the case that had the subcrystal orbital abscess. So I was thinking like in terms of anatomically, like the orbit is very close to the brain and the 
the infections can potentially spread to the brain bronchi. But in the meantime, patient presentation should be, be very accurate. And it wouldn't like take that amount of time that uh, the infections from eye orbit um, spread to the brain. So but is it common that uh, in such cases in orbital abscess, in the meantime, we notice any brain abscess as well? That's a good question. Um, I have not seen, well, I'll divide patients into two groups. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, two people in who I showed who had an immunocompromised state. And those were people who had the infection was secondary to um, a fungus. You know, so those that that was the case where um, someone just had uh, like it was a right maxillary sinus infection, and then there's the other person or the patient who died within a few days where they had a facial and sinus infection. That's a very unique situation where things will move very fast. So that is a case where you can get orbital infection. Everything can start getting infected. I mean, it's just so it's so dramatic initially. Um, there's really so little you can do as well. You know, I mentioned if there's some sort of mass effect that you can address, um, then that I could see them doing it. But it's it's almost like where do you stop? Because you just have to debride all the dead tissue potentially. So those are cases where I could see an orbit infection quickly going into the intracranial compartment. You like be cavernous sinus thrombosis and then spread in that route, especially with the valvulus veins. In my experience, I have not seen someone who has a like a bacterial uh, abscess infection. I showed you the the case of like the, the cryocystitis. I showed you a case of the subperiosteal abscess in the orbit. I have not seen that go intracranial. I'm sure the natural history of the disease is potentially to do that, but we catch them within days generally. So we see dramatic orbital complications and ones that require significant surgical intervention, but not to the point that, uh, not on a bacterial, uh, simple bacterial infection have I seen go into the intracranial compartment. If you see that, generally it's fast, and it, again, it's with those, those, fungal, uh, those fungal pathogens, the invasive fungal sinusitis. I see. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that's all for the questions. And uh, thank you for your time and giving this very insightful talk. It was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I guess that concludes our grand round for this week. Yeah, certainly. It's, it's a pleasure for, for me too. Thank you, Sina. And thank you, uh, Dr. Dillon. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'm sure that the, the moderators, administrators have my email address if someone wants to email me on the side. I'm happy to answer any questions after this talk as well. Of course, of course. We will share your email uh, in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye.